Greetings, cultivators from around the world. Jordan River here, again, on a never-ending search for Terps. We are back with more Growcast podcast. We're here for Worldwide December. We're all over the country. We're all over the globe talking to cultivators about their local regions, about their climates, about their legislation. We're getting to know the cannabis community on a global scale, a very special month that we have here planned at Growcast, and a very special inaugural guest for Worldwide December. Today, we are speaking to Martin Condon from Ireland, and this man is an ex-cultivator, a longtime cultivator. He is an activist, and he is very, very knowledgeable on all the things that are going on across the pond when it comes to cannabis. You're going to absolutely love this episode, and make sure to check out Martin's podcast, which is called Martin's World Podcast. Before we get into it with Martin, got to give some love to AC Infinity. AACinfinity.com is where you'll find the sexiest grow tents, brand new grow lights, and of course, the best fans in the game. That's where they started, but they've expanded to so much more. Code GROWCAST15 for 15% off. 1-5, that's 15% off with code GROWCAST15. Get everything you need. They've got fabric pots, scissors, ratchet hangers. I just got a Cloud Lab tent, and it is so nice. Super, super nice. They've got the uh, extra thick canvas, uh, heavy-duty, sturdy zippers, And most importantly, the poles on those tents are twice as thick. I felt as soon as I put together those bottom four poles into a base, I felt a noticeable difference in the sturdiness from those extra thick, extra heavy poles. That's thick with two C's. ACinfinity.com, that's one C. Code BROCAST15 for 15% off. All right, everybody, let's get into it with our brand new guest. Welcome to Worldwide December. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to spread the show. Tell a grower about Growcast. It's how you help me out the most. Turn someone onto the show. Make sure you're subscribed. And of course, hit growcastpodcast.com slash membership for incredible cannabis cultivation content, hundreds of hours of member content, uh, the Discord. I'm always hanging out in the Discord. Come say hey. We got the community bumping over there. Today, speaking of community, we're continuing our worldwide cannabis tour. That's right. It's Growcast Worldwide. We're going all across the United States to speak to growers outside of the United States. And now today's episode, bringing us all the way across the pond to Europe from all the way from Ireland. We have from the Martin's World podcast, Martin C is on the line. What's up, Martin? Hey, Jordan. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you, my friend. Martin's World podcast. Go and check it out, everybody. Uh, you may have heard of of this individual from the High on Homegrown episode we were talking in, and your name came up, Martin. Yeah. So uh, we had to get you on the show, man. We love what you're doing. Excellent. Glad to hear. And uh, it's, it's, it's geez, blows me away that uh, even what I do gets uh, across the pond to ourselves. So uh, <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. We're going to talk today about uh, cannabis in Ireland, the situation out there, your incredible activism work. We'll talk about cultivation and everything. But first, let's get a little brief background on yourself, your history in Ireland, what brought you to become so passionate about the cannabis plant, and then what eventually spurred you to become an activist for the cannabis plant. Yeah, well, I suppose it's important to say that my, my journey with cannabis uh, would have started off um, as um, an anti-cannabis uh, believer. Like uh, I would have bought into some of the uh, myths and hysteria around cannabis and it rot in your brain if, uh, <laughs> if you consume it and stuff. And this, this was going back to an age when I was... Uh, 15. And I'll never forget, it was one morning going to school, uh, going to secondary school with my cousin on a bus. And my, I, I say in that, those particular words to my cousin, you know, how are you smoking that hash for? That's going to rot your brain. And, and it had been only be about a week or two later, and that same cousin, along with another cousin, uh, a bit of peer pressure, they were like, go on, try it out, sir. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I didn't. Um, I really enjoyed it, to be fair. Like, And while well, I don't condone um, cannabis use for, for minors, um, for me, I, I managed to get access to it, and uh, I largely it was beneficial in my experience with it. Right, it, it kept me out of trouble, really. You know, because we we would have uh, got a bit of hash um, and stayed in. We would have watched some movies, and and that was kind of it. Like there was very social kind of um, consumption of uh, the hash at the time, whereas there, there was opportunities there. You know, or uh, some other friends. Um, 
might, might have went off and robbing cars and stuff while they were out right. drinking. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, no, no, I'm going to stay here smoking another joint and uh, maybe watch another bit of Cheech and Chong. <laughs> the hooliganism. Um, so it, like, it kept you away from the hooliganism. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Big time, because I, I was definitely at risk of that because but before I ever trying cannabis, I, I would have been very impulsive and, and, and not very engaged with my thoughts. If an opportunity arose to go on an adventure, as I might have seen them, um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have ever kind of shied away from that. Wow, I love that, man. Yeah, when, when cannabis was introduced, I was able to engage more with my thoughts and maybe think about, you know, maybe that's not such a good idea. Maybe it's better that I just stay here, chill and relax and... Um, go home and uh, early and my mom and I would be right. happy and all of that, you know? And so, so for me, I, I always uh, would have associated cannabis, uh, even at that earlier age, with being um, a beneficial thing in my life. And it wasn't until I was 17 um, that I, I first had an interaction with the law and um, my first ever negative experience as a result of cannabis. And uh, that, that is where the spark of my passion. <laughs> all the way back act- at 17. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. That, that's where I got ignited. My, my spark for uh, activism got, got ignited. That interaction with the law, it was very unpleasant. Uh, left me feeling uneasy and uh, rather um, I, uh, victimized, I suppose is how I, I would describe it. You know, you're just kind of like, when, when the law is gone afterwards, after the stop and search has happened, you're just kind of like, what, what, what just happened there? You know, right. you're completely powerless throughout the whole situation. Like on that evening that happened, the guards, the lights came on behind the car. We got pulled in. Um, we weren't smoking in the car. I was actually out with my girlfriend um, and I just happened to have a little bit of hash inside in the car. And when the cops pulled me in and they asked me, have you anything in the car that uh, you shouldn't? And we're going to search the car, so you might as well tell us now. I was like, well, look, I have a little piece of hash there in the glove box. So they, they still searched the car. They, they ripped the whole thing apart, took all my belongings out. Um, they, they turned it upside down and... My car was quite tidy at the time, um, but it wasn't there for this experience. <laughs> so I, I went home that night and I looked up the law that they, they read out to me at the side of the road, which was the Misuse of Drugs Act, a simple possession here in, in Ireland. And I, I was just kind of like, where, where does this come from? And I learned like 1977. I was like, that, that's quite some time ago. Um, you think about what we know now compared to what we know then. Like mm-hmm. back in 1977, like condoms were illegal in Ireland. Like, <laughs> oh, <they> were- man. <laughs> Yeah, gay, gay relationships were also illegal here um, and prohibited. Oh, man. So maybe 1977 isn't the, the bastion of righteousness that we should be basing all our current laws on. I definitely, <laughs> I definitely think there's a time frame in which laws should be re-examined. And uh, <laughs> over 50 years is certainly uh, beyond what, what, what's uh, required. So. I shouldn't laugh, but but that is, that is amusing, I, I have to say. Yeah, well, that, it wasn't really amusing for me. I, I was just kind of like just gobsmacked by the whole thing because right. it went... But back beyond 1977, because uh, I was looking as to how these laws originated in Ireland. And um, before 1977, there was actually another law which uh, prohibited, they called it uh, Egyptian cigarettes, I think, or Egyptian hemp or something, uh, or Indian tobacco, apologies, Indian tobacco is uh, how they referred to cannabis at the time in Irish law uh, prior to 1977. And they came into Ireland through the the, uh, League of Nations um, which is now known as the United Nations. And it was largely pushed on us um, through, through uh, efforts by the United States. Um, and, and we all know where the United States is today in regards to its laws and cannabis. But right. that, that's kind of really where the, the laws, how the laws came to Ireland. It was through efforts there with the League of Nations, through pressure from the U.S. Um, as we all know, the, the U.S. was ending their prohibition of alcohol at the time and uh, they wanted something else to kind of go after and just this kind of yep, prohibition. 100%. Of and there was also an influx. Um, you, you take a look at the timeline to the cannabis laws, influx of uh, immigrants from Mexico. You're 100% right. And I didn't know that was the League of Nations. That's really interesting. After World War One, you know, they like you said, they formed this proto UN that didn't take off. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of people haven't heard of the League of Nations. Um, and then that kind of dissolved and fell apart. And, and after World War Two, the United Nations had taken over. But in that brief spirit, uh, that brief period after 1918 and, and before 1935, the start of the Second World War, the League of Nations managed to come to Ireland and implement those laws. Before that, was there any cannabis culture? Do you know? Um, prior to that, hemp was uh, well, cannabis was grown across the island for its uh, fiber properties, for its food properties. There's a lot of evidence to, to show that cannab- or the cannabis plant was uh, grown and utilized here for a long time, especially given that uh, Ireland being a British colony, 
hemp was, uh, and cannabis, the, the plant uh, which hemp comes from, that the fibers are incredibly valuable. And therefore, any colonies of Britain were growing that plant. Sure. Um, and there, there was extensive research done pr- prior to the colonization of Ireland, actually, as to its uh, viability to grow this uh, plant um, for the British colony to, to kind of uh, kit out their, their fleet. So the cannabis plant really, like uh, throughout history, right throughout the millennia, it's played a, a, a vital part of our society. And, and it's only within this last little, small little window, this, this last, let's say, 100 years, that, that this prohibition has existed right. and the harms of befalling our society because of uh, the prohibition and not the plant. Yeah, it is rather ridiculous. Um, and I do want to get into gross specifics. I'd love to talk to you about, you know, the climate in Ireland and different strains and stuff like that. But let, let's stick on legislation first for just a few more minutes. Excellent. We've had Irish guests kind of briefly talk about the Irish medical system right now. I, I know there is a medical program in Ireland. I understand it's extremely restrictive and immoral. Uh, do you want to speak on what the current laws are for any sort of medical legal use and then follow up? What do you think is holding it back? Is it political interests and business interests like here in America? Is it um, puritanism? What is why? Why do the laws suck and what's holding them back in your opinion? Excellent. Yeah, um, great questions. The, the, the answer to the first part, the current laws in Ireland um, around medical cannabis. So at the moment, we have what's referred to as a medical cannabis access program where patients are able to get access to approved medical cannabis uh, products currently listed under that program are, I believe, four products, but only two of them are currently available to the patients. Jesus. So four are approved for use, but two are only actually available for use due to reasons you know, um, that the suppliers could probably only uh, explain. And then when it comes to the patients who can actually get um, access to it, a friend of mine put this very well. It's, it's almost as if the uh, people who came up with the recommendations uh, in Ireland, they're the Health Products Regulatory Authority, the HPRA. It's almost as if they went through the research, the evidence for medical use of cannabis and found like some of the most restrictive conditions in which they can apply it for they chose uh, all refractory conditions. So these are conditions in which uh, you've already exhausted all of the conventional, uh, mainstream conventional medicines oh. that are available um, before you're allowed access to cannabis. That's uh, nausea to do with uh, chemo- chemotherapy. There is uh, refractory epilepsy. And uh, there is also uh, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis um, so again, like uh, very specific even on that one with multiple sclerosis because multiple sclerosis, not everybody with that condition suffers with spasticity. Right. But they can suffer with the pain associated, the lack of sleep, you know, which interferes with their their, uh, yeah. their ability to eat and, and, and all Inflation, of those other kind yeah. of things which attribute to ex- Exactly. So it's an incredibly restrictive uh, program here at the moment for uh, patients the patients actually, none of them have access uh, as, as far as I'm, I am aware currently through that program. Um, still all of the patients, uh, and I believe there's less than 50 currently in Ireland who have got access to uh, legal medical cannabis. And there is only, I, I believe it's 60% of them are actually being um, reimbursed for their, their medicine. So um, that, that means 40% of them actually have to, to foot the bill there them, themselves. And it's, it's quite an expensive bill there. Um, Hey, dude. Uh, many of the patients uh, who've actually been uh, given the license uh, have actually rescinded it, uh, let it go because they couldn't afford the uh, legal medicine and they're going to maybe grow on their own or, or getting it from the black market because it's uh, cheaper there, which is a real crime in itself. Man, that's insane. And, and listen, we argue here in the States who's got the worst medical program. Like, you know, here in Illinois, we've got a really corrupt medical program. It's 22 cultivators yeah. serving the entire state, including Chicago, a city of millions and millions of people. Like, we all have it pretty corrupt. You take a look at uh, everything's all pretty bad. You take a look at New Jersey. It's pretty corrupt. Man, Ireland might take the cake. I'm not kidding. This sounds like the most nonsensical, least applicable least patient helping medical program I've ever heard in the history of cannabis. I defy anybody to send me a worse one. Do you guys have the worst medical yeah. program on the planet? Quite possibly. And I can <laughs> blow your mind a little bit more if, you, if you'd like. Um, Please. In regards to, to how our court system currently treats some of our patients here in Ireland. Uh, in, in the last 12 months, um, given COVID and the pandemic and all of that stuff, um, our Gardaí, our authorities, uh, police force, 
Um, they have a lot more time in their hands uh, to, to kind of police the, the streets because we don't have many as drunk people out there because uh, our, our pubs only, and nightclubs only opened uh, within the last two weeks. So given the last 12 months, they've had a lot more free time than what they had before. Oh boy. And they're, they're carrying out a lot more stop and searches and they're doing a lot more targeting of uh, small scale drug use and, and maybe low level drug dealing, if you would call that. Jesus. And um, basically sharing of cannabis maybe between friends. But in that then, what's been caught up has been a lot of patients. Um, one patient by the name of Paul Lee, um, he's uh, in his 50s from below West Cork here in Ireland. And uh, he got caught with four euros worth of cannabis, which uh, the, in Ireland's um, valuation is less than 0.25 of a gram. So less than quarter of a gram this guy got caught with. And he was dragged through the courts. And uh, the, the judge actually wouldn't give him the benefit of community service until... Uh, what he, the, 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 the judge's words were, you can have a community service when you're clean. So he was basically, and not saying it directly, regarding the guy as being dirty because he was using cannabis. Jesus. Now, now Paul Lee, the, the, just the, again, to put it in perspective, he, he had a history of um, addiction where, with opiates. So I believe he had a history of maybe abuse and heroin oh and, and opiate dr- drugs. And uh, also, then to make things worse, he, he had a, a medical condition to do with his back, which uh, left him in, in cr- suffering with chronic pain. Uh, and the doctor wanted to prescribe him opiates. And he, that didn't sit well with him because yeah. he was like, if I, or like, for him, as he described, how can I kind of define when I'm using my opiates you know, to manage my pain and when I fall back into it, kind of abusing the opiates as he had addiction to them before? Cannabis to him, it was much more um, a holistic way of uh, treating his pain. Mm. And, uh, yeah, he, he was not giving any benefit of it out there in, in, in the courts. That's so you know, that there was no shame directed back on the government. All the shame was on the patient. You know, how dare you treat your condition yourself and not go to the approved process, which is incredibly restrictive anyway. Well, that leads, my, that leads me to my second part of the question. Do you guys have big pharma uh, out there just pushing these fucking pills down doctors' throats and well, any holistic medicine that can take the place of an anti-seizure drug and an appetite stimulator and to help people with cancer and to help people with glaucoma. Big pharma, big alcohol, big tobacco, they feel threatened. They go to the politicians, they get in their ear, they cut them huge checks in some bullshit way. Come give a speech to our corporation. We'll pay you $300,000 for a speech. Just make sure that you vote no on the cannabis bill. Is that what's going on there? Or or is it like you said, that judge almost seems like he believed what he was saying. Is it like a puritanical mindset? I definitely think there's a bit of both there going on. I definitely think the judges and some of the guards believe that what they're doing is is righteous and it's the it's the right thing to do and it's it's morally correct. And I don't think it's as blatant as what it is in the US, but <laughs> there is definitely heavy lobbying going on of our, of our politicians and by the big pharma groups. Maybe not as much here in, in Ireland, but even on a European level, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of brown envelopes uh, passing hands. But definitely, you know, say in, in America nice. and, and New Zealand, I think they're the only two places in, in the planet where uh, pharmaceuticals are allowed to be advertised uh, on your TV and, and stuff like that. So we, we don't have that here in Ireland. So, oh, yeah. um, oh, you don't know what that looks like. You're allowed to show boobs on TV and everything in Europe, right? Yeah, we're allowed to show all that stuff, but no advertising. Oh, that's drugs. insane. No, even you, you, we blur out nipples. In, in here in the yeah. states, and even if like uh, like a chick is bending down and and uh, she's she's got the thong showing or like a butt crack showing, I've seen that blurred out on television before. But then it cuts to the commercials, and this you'll find this interesting, Martin. Not only do we advertise the pills on TV, but people realized like how how kind of like messed up that is. So they pass this law where you have to name side effects of your medication during your ad. You can't not, you can't run an ad without mentioning the side effects. That is now in law. For those here in America, if you ever wondered why they put that huge list of crazy fucking side effects at the end of every drug commercial, it's because that's by law. So Martin, it'll be like, come and try Xantrastafol. Uh, you know, it'll help you sleep. And the guy's sleeping so soundly and he's like riding a bike the next day. It's like, oh, it's going to fix all your problems. Side effects may include rectal bleeding, bleeding from the eyes, uh, indigestion, sleepwalking. Uh, it's like all this crazy <laughs> shit. And they say it all really fast. You would think it was hilarious, uh, Martin. It's like, it is fucking, yeah. it's bizarro world. There's a very good parody of those uh, videos, isn't there, of, uh, of cannabis when they're listing off the side effects of cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like, side effects might include uh, laughter, uh, 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 hunger, <laughs> sleepiness. <laughs> yeah, totally. Munchies. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. All, all kind of very pleasant kind of uh, side effects. 
that doesn't include death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, that's that you'll hear that a lot in those side effects. In rare cases, death. That was <laughs> in rare cases. Exactly. Oh shit. But, but here, here in Ireland, um, just just to go back to the, the laws here in Ireland, and you know that that's the current state of affairs uh, here in Ireland. But we've had a number of, of opportunities over the last couple of years to change that. One of the first opportunities would have gone back as far back as 2013 to a guy by the name of Luke Ming Flanagan. He was a TD here in Ireland. He put forward a bill to uh, legalize and regulate cannabis and, and included within that were provisions there to care for patients. You know, he was referring to the medicinal use of cannabis mm-hmm. and he differentiated it from the kind of recreational, using air quotes there, um, adult use of cannabis. And that was the first opportunity. And to, to quote Luke Ming Flanagan himself, um, he said afterwards that when that bill was being debated before it was voted on, he could tell that those debating against it didn't even read a word out of the bill by some of what they were saying, because what they were bringing up, some of the worries, the concerns, they were, they were answered within the bill. And uh, that, that's, again, going back to that kind of puritanical um, kind of a belief there that, uh, again, cannabis is the devil's lettuce here in Ireland. So th- these guys, as soon as they, they see any kind of thing, mention of cannabis, that that's what comes up. The barriers, the defense walls comes up and they have to defend their beliefs, their ideology that cannabis is an, an evil drug um, at all costs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even at the cost of sick, vulnerable patients um, and some of the patients here in Ireland, um, some of the ones that have uh, really captured the hearts of the public have, have been very young kids um, suffering with severe forms of epilepsy. So we go forward from there then to 2016 and we had uh, Gene O'Kenny um, who's currently putting forward another bill to legalise cannabis this year uh, to be published next month actually legalise the adult use of it. But he put forward a bill in 2016 specifically for medical use. It wasn't anything to do with adult use, uh, recreational use, none of that at all, just specifically medical uh, use alone. Um, would include included in that then would have been provisions for people who might have been suffering with chronic pain, even people with, suffering with appetite problems, uh, insomnia. Um, it would have been uh, really opening up the door to the therapeutic uses of uh, cannabis, but the door still would have been closed to adult use. The government, again, uh, they, they unanimously supported it on the first vote. And then that goes through to a second vote. So it's, uh, it's referred to as an amendment stage. So the opposition government um, have an opportunity to put forward amendments changes that they would like to see within the bill put forward by uh, Gino Kenny. They basically killed the bill there. They stalled it um, in what they do here in Ireland is called uh, a money matter. So the Taoiseach at the time, he puts a money matter on the bill and the bill is just basically stuck in this limbo now and it doesn't move anywhere. So oh, I went, no. we went from the first <laughs> stage having every TD voted for it except one. I think there might have been one TD who voted against the bill. Uh, everyone else voted for it and to go to the second stage then to be killed and for the government then to kind of kick the can down the road um, to develop their own, what I r- r- um, described earlier, the Medical Cannabis Access Programme, which as of today, it's, it's, it was supposed to be active in 2018. Still to date, it's not active. It only got funding in June of this year, even though it was supposed oh. to be funded back at the end of 2018. Um, the, the government here are, are really shameless in, in how they treat their, their citizens and they're very vulnerable Shameful and shameless. You know, it's kind of, I've said this before, and, uh, and it's, no, it's no consolation to you, but um, it is nice to see that governments around the world same, face the same problems that we face here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. You know, our government is, is horribly corrupt and interest-based and, and all of that, and at least we're not alone, I guess. And so you try to be grateful for what they kind of have, what personal freedoms they have allowed you to retain. And then you also see what you can do to make a difference. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people are drawn to make a difference. I don't think everyone needs to make a difference. I think some people feel like if they don't, they're a bad person or, you know, you haven't done enough. There's a lot of comparing what people have done, but I look at people who, who are involved in activism, for instance, and they just, you know, make Instagram posts all day or they, (laughs) uh, you know, they tweet about it all the time or they argue with people online, which I think doesn't move the needle at all. I'm so not interested in that. I couldn't even begin to, to think that that was productive. I take a look at people like you, though, some of the stunts that you've pulled. I mean, we like to do grower education here at Growcast. We're just doing our little part. We know it helps a lot of cannabis growers. We're not out there fucking marching on Capitol Hill. Or, I mean, I, I'm interested in that sort of thing, but we try to stick to our lane. As the homegrown helper guys, but you give zero fucks, man. 
You do all sorts <laughs> of crazy shit. Can you talk about some of, I mean, I don't, I don't want to like blast it out there cause I don't know what you're comfortable sharing with what you've done or whatever, but like you've done what can only be described as guerrilla activism. And I would like to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no problem at all. I suppose for, for me, um, my kind of zero fucks attitude uh, was born out of watching um, at a time in, in Ireland, I suppose, again, put it in perspective when there was a lot of contaminated cannabis going around. And I was just after buying an ounce of cannabis, which cost me 300 euro, um, the equivalent of a, a week's wage for me at the time. And it was sprayed with fiberglass. And that's terrible. So I don't know if you've ever seen cannabis that's been sprayed with fiberglass. What? Yeah, when you roll it into a joint and you start smoking it, the, the ashes um, don't come off. Like they don't fall apart. They did like turn into a solid. And people were smoking that here in Ireland um, for quite a while. Back going back to maybe 2010, what that, that would have been. Um, why yeah, were, why yeah. were cultivators or dealers even doing that to make it look more trichome laden? To make it look more trichome laden and to add weight to it which was another reason. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, that there was sand being found in people's um, uh, cannabis. There, there was all sorts of contaminants being found in people's cannabis over here for uh, a period of time. But it was on one evening uh, after I got that ounce and I got home and I was after being assured by the guy, yeah, it's good stuff, it's good stuff. I was smoking myself, it's great. Go home, made a joint and I was just like, about, uh, it's only after uh, two puffs off the thing, I was like, no, there's something off with this. It doesn't taste right. And I went to top the ash and I could see it straight away. I was like, oh, I was raging. That evening, I, 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 what, what did I find that evening? But uh, Run From The Cure, the Rick Simpson documentary. And after watching that, I, I was like, to say I was pissed off is an understatement. I'm just like, here I am with a big bag of what should be a medicinal product uh, and full of like from Rick Simpson's uh, documentary, an anti-cancerous bloody plant uh, that can help people alleviate their uh, cancers. And meanwhile, it's, it's bloody covered in this fiberglass, which is going to give you a cancer if you start consuming it. So, so meanwhile, like people will start developing cancers and associate that with their cannabis use, but never realize that it was actually the fiberglass that gave it to them. So, so for me, like once I watched that documentary, I was just like, I, I don't give a fuck anymore. I, I went out the next day. I was after getting, um, I had a bit of money saved up. I went out, I bought, bought a, uh, um, some plywood, uh, a grow light, uh, some fans, and I made my own little grow box um, in a spare room I had. And I just started to grow my own cannabis. Um, I'd done it quietly, I kept it to myself. Done it for a good couple of years before I, I stopped, uh, about two or three years ago now. Mm -hmm. But I was looking after a good couple of friends there. I had a few uh, patients as well that were being uh, looked after through that as um, and unfortunately, um, one or two of them have passed away now since, but uh, they, they got great benefit from the cannabis when, when they were using it. And from my experience, from everything I, I, I kind of experienced over those years, um, in, in the last year or so, I've just been like, you know what, F the law, you know, to, to put it bluntly. And I, I just started engaging in these acts of uh, public civil disobedience. <laughs> so last year in Cork, I, I would have encouraged people to come down to a protest, uh, a picnic in the park, uh, protest that we organized. So it was basically you know, bring your blanket, but bring your own weed as well was the uh, the kind of the advice we were given uh, protesters because that's that was the aim of the protest to, for people to engage in the consumption of cannabis uh, openly in large numbers and in, in defiance of the law. Um, that was our mm -hmm. protest. It went, went off very, very successfully throughout the whole day. And then just, just after 4.20, so we were allowed to uh, have our little 4.20 spark up and about 4.30, and there's a video up in line, this, uh, you might want to go look it up, but it's quite dramatic. There was like seven or eight uh, vehicles uh, of our Gardaí here, and um, vans, like armed response unit uh, coming down, and uh, they, they caused a mass panic. Everybody ran. And from that then, uh, I was just like, you know what, if they're going to come down on us like this over a protest, um, I'm going to take the protest to them next. So a week after that, uh, I went into the city, I held a protest in the city where I encouraged members of the public to come by and plant the seed of uh, freedom. It was a cannabis seed and I was calling them seeds of freedom on the day. And uh, the aim was to get as many people uh, as possible to plant the seed on video. And uh, many wow. people did that. And they did it happily in, on the video. And then I, I talked a pot with all of the planted seeds down to the guard station only around the corner. And the guards were there watching this happen on the day because uh, after the protest the week uh, previous, they, they were now, I was on the radar, they were watching me. Um, so they had like, <laughs> oh, shit. yeah, they had six guards there on the day watching um, from various locations. 
And then they were kind of like, what's he doing now? And when I marched up to the Garda station, so they were not expecting that at all. And I went into the Garda station and I uh, knocked at the reception and uh, presented myself. I was like, look, I, I'm presenting myself and I'm uh, admitting to breaking the law around the cultivation of cannabis. I was like, I have a pot here. Within that are seeds of uh, the genus cannabis. And I've cultivated those without a license. And here I am presenting myself now. And uh, this is a protest as well, by the way. Um, Remain complete respect to the officers, the authorities wow. that are dealing with there with the day. Um, you know, you have to be respectful and professional when carrying out this kind of a protest. Hell yes. And that, that was incredibly successful. You know, I got a great response from the public. Um, no, there was no backlash from the public. There was nobody kind of, oh, you know, that, that's a terrible um, thing to be doing, you know, shaming you. But there, there was not. And it was actually incredibly uh, supportive, uh, the response from the public. After that, then uh, I just was, this needs to be done more. And I vowed then this year um, to go out and do a protest once every month, uh, a minimum once every month. And uh, I've continued to honor that right up until uh, this month. <laughs> um, oh, so I've, I've carried out a, a number of protests across uh, the year this year. Going back as far as January, starting off this year, I went into the Garda station here um, with cannabis and I presented myself with cannabis. So again, I got some small bits of cannabis here. Um, again, there's a video up in line of that. There's one on February and uh, Valentine's Day. The protest there that day was uh, flowers for the Gardaí. So I brought cannabis flowers down to the Gardaí that day. <laughs> again, express, <laughs> wow. expressing my love for the work that they done. I love it, dude. <laughs> uh, just really quickly, I, I, I introduced you as Martin C. Should we give your full name so people can Google you? How can people find these videos? Of course, yeah. Martin Condon is my name. Yeah, I've, I've run in the elections here in Ireland as well. So, um, yeah, I'm very public about my... <laughs> so you're uh, fairly uh, available to find on the internet. C-O-N-D-O-N. Martin Condon. Go and uh, check out the videos. Subscribe to Martin's World, of course. Yeah, all, all of those videos are up there. All of those protests are up in Martin's World on YouTube if anybody wants to check them out. I just got to tell you how, how enamored I am with that strategy. I think there's a lot to dig into there. We'll be back with Martin in a second, but first, I have a huge announcement to make about membership. I told you changes were coming. Well, changes have come. That's right. We've even renamed it. I'm proud to unveil the brand new membership name and membership structure, the Order of Cultivation. That's right. Bringing order to the chaotic cannabis community. Come check out all the new stuff at growcastpodcast.com slash join the order. Not only do we still have the weekly GCT fee live streams, not only do we still have the AMAs and the Discord community for 24-7 plant support and celebration about your garden, but now we also have regional chapters that you can join so that you can connect with other growers, uh, anonymous chapters. If you don't want to be out there, you can work your way up in rank, earn special prizes for your grow, special edition art for your tent, special edition shirts as you move up in rank in the order of cultivation. Now, we still stand by our same principles. We are here to uplift other cultivators. We are not here to bicker or argue or divide each other on subjects like, I don't know, lighting brands or cultivation method or breeders that you choose. This is what we believe the cannabis industry needs, and we're making it a reality with the order of cultivation. Find us now, growcastpodcast.com slash join the order. All the old member benefits, plus a bunch of new features. We're over in Discord. You will not regret it, everybody. Come and join the order. I'll see you on the inside. And like I said, we've still got the weekly GCTV show. It's getting better and better. We've still got Discord support so that you're never stumped in your grow. We've just added a whole nother level of community and engagement. You won't believe it. Growcastpodcast.com slash join the order. All one word. All right. Thanks, everybody. Let's get back to Martin's world. I just got to tell you how how enamored I am with that strategy. I think there's a lot to dig into there. Yeah. First of all, it's cultivation oriented, which which is our mission. There's so many people here in the United States. We're, we're kind of at a different place where a lot of states have come online. There's still a lot of work to do, but we're kind of, I don't know, you could say more progress down the line where there's more access and stuff. But what we're trying to encourage is all of these people who love smoking to come over to the very few people who realize that it's a plant that you can grow and love growing. So the, the fact that you've integrated cultivation where it's like plant the seed is just so incredible. You also said something really important, though, which is like, you know, I'm no I'm no protest specialist or expert or anything, but this is just my thoughts and feeling on the matter. I could not agree more when it comes to being respectful and 
logical and having integrity mm-hmm. when you try to change someone's mind about a strongly held belief. That's why these protests work because there's a there's a kind of contrast between the evil that they think this thing represents and how you are behaving in front of them. When you start to yell or scream your ideas, you know, down at someone or or jump down someone's throat or criticize their religion because it's holding you back from your personal freedoms, that's a very poor way to get someone to change their mind. I like your approach because it's peaceful. It's peaceful, but in your face. And those are the things that you like really can't ignore. And I feel, again, make a difference. So I want to give you props on that and then maybe follow up also. Is this an idea that you, I mean, I know you're going to say yes, but like, I want to do this. I want to encourage people to do this two-step process. Can we take this idea with credit, of course, and continue this, this kind of, um, guerrilla activism and, 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 uh, like you said, counter protest planting. Is that a possibility? Of course. Well, if I find to be totally honest, like I, I would have uh, originally borrowed it from, uh, across the pond, um, the, the, there was, I can't recall off the top of my head now the, the guy's name, um, but I think it might have been in Michigan. Again, I could be missing up the place as well. But over 50 years ago in the US, um, a guy marched into um, a, a local uh, sheriff station, I think, or police station, and lit up a joint or proclaimed that he had a cannabis joint uh, <laughs> in defiance of back to civil disobedience. So that's kind of where I got this from, as well as the, you know, the Rosa Parks, um, again, the Muhammad Gandhi this peaceful civil disobedience protest. Um, you know, there's been many sources of my inspiration for this, but without those, uh, this idea wouldn't have been anything. But oh my God. Yeah, gladly, yes. I would I'd be more than happy if uh, more people got on board with this because, again, if, if you have a belief, um, well, what's the point in having it if you're not willing to stand up for that belief? And if you don't believe you're a criminal for possession of cannabis or for the cultivation of cannabis, then you shouldn't have a problem with breaking that law um, when there is nobody getting hurt. And, and I can understand that everybody can afford to do that given jobs and mortgages and, and things like that. But can you afford not to do it for this conti- prohibition to continue? Um, you know, future generations that face the same problems that you uh, knew identified as a problem but weren't uh, willing to do something right. it for it um, out of fear. So it's, it's, it's just have to look deep down inside and, and to try to find that within yourself to, to, to overcome that fear. Because for many people, there will be a fear there of, geez, the authorities will come for me. But again, we have to remember, if, if enough of us do it together, they can't target us all. We, we, like, even in Ireland, the uh, cannabis consumption uh, consuming population, based off the, a recent uh, survey done, and it's a pretty prestigious uh, survey that was done. It was uh, the Eurobarometer. It's regarded as a fair, fairly high-ranking um, survey. But they found that uh, 17% of uh, the Irish adult population consumed cannabis within the last 12 months um, of that survey. I believe it was done in 2019. Um, So so you're talking somewhere in the region of uh, 400,000 people here in in Ireland, um, based upon that number, um, consume cannabis. That's quite a large portion of the population. If if we only got 1% of of that 400,000, you know, 1% of 400,000 is still 4,000 people. That's quite a lot of uh, court cases for our our courts and our, our um, public prosecution service to be processing, um, you know, and we could really, you know, it's, it's a bit of peaceful anarchy in, in its own right. You know, it's, it's an anarchy. It's a form of anarchy in its own way because you're, you're, you're seeking for, for me. That's what I'm hoping is that enough people would do this uh, to kind of uh, cause a problem within the system where, you know, court cases are taking uh, two and three years to be brought to court because there's just a backlog of uh, all of this paperwork because of, this extra two or three thousand cases now coming in every month because of these protests. Um, you know, <laughs> in, in, in Ireland, just to put it in perspective again, um, there, there is uh, on average um, about 16 to 18,000 people every year um, criminalized for just simple possession of cannabis, just cannabis alone. Jesus. That's not even other drugs. 16 to 17, uh, 16 to 18,000 people on average. In such a small country, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, we we, are, we we love our green over here, apparently. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Green Ireland, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I, I just, I respect what you're doing so much. Godspeed, of course, and uh, the, the Growcast universe is behind you. Uh, we'll figure out our own little spin on it. Maybe we'll, maybe it's about giving feminized seeds to first-time growers, or maybe it's about planting them. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure that out, but stay tuned. Maybe there's something, uh, something of a collab there. You mentioned green Ireland and, and the Irish loving their green, though. So we got to make sure, I don't know, we got about 20 minutes here left before we uh, have the hard out, as they say. 
Got to talk cultivation, man. As we do this kind of global exploration (laughs) at Growcast, the main things we're interested in are dealing with your local climate, what type of strains were around. uh, That's where I got to start, man. You said you were growing like years ago. What type of strains, what what names were you getting back in the day or maybe from old heads who were like, oh, I remember this strain. What are some Irish cannabis staples? Yeah, that, that's that's the thing. That's something that's probably absent really from from Ireland, uh, but in large part, uh, there would have been maybe small, very small um, niches um, where cannabis probably was grown and shared, uh, maybe within um, what might be seen as uh, hippie communes and stuff like that. But it wasn't really until the last maybe 10, 20 years that cannabis has been grown um, a lot more across Ireland. But still, there's uh, there's very little of a community here where strains and genetics are being developed and, and shared amongst uh growers and communities, at least I'm, I'm not aware of it if it is going on out there. Um, but but one, one or two names, that, or one name that uh, I am aware of was uh, West Coast Wanderer. That, that was a, a strain that was developed down on the west coast of Ireland, again, grown down there by uh, some of the locals. Oh, West Coast Wonder. I love it. Yeah, the West Coast Wonder, developed down on West Cork. And that was available to, uh, through one of the uh, the kind of head shops here in Ireland where you could go in and buy those seeds. And, and it would finish up early enough. It would uh, finish up uh, to maybe September, mid-September, which was great because if, if you go on any further than September, if you hit August, you, you're going to have serious problems here with bud rot because of uh, the humidity here in Ireland. It just goes oh, through the roof uh, once you get into those later months. The Irish mist turns into Irish botrytis. Yeah, exactly. That's brutal. Yeah, it, it, it's not good at all. And I, I've seen that first time myself at one or two outdoor grows here where, when I wasn't so knowledgeable as to, you know, the, um, the different regions in which plants can be developed. And I would always be, uh, if anybody's still growing in Ireland, you would always want to be going for a plant that was developed in a region above ours just to ensure that it finishes uh, that a little bit earlier. Because uh, I, I think we're in uh, zone six or something like that here in Ireland, but really we'd be looking for um, seven, eight, or nine. I think nine is what, where Holland is at, um, and that's probably more preferred for Ireland's outdoor climate, anyway, at least. <laughs> um, uh, but well, yeah, cannabis kind of so, well, wasn't really around Ireland. Um, it was largely soap or hash that we had there uh, right up until the kind of uh, early 2000s. And then we had a problem with the hash becoming tainted with diesel and stuff like that. And then the cannabis came around. And then obviously you had later problems with the contaminated cannabis oh. back in 2010. Um, but, but definitely there, there is, a, there, there is a, a good growing community starting to develop here now in Ireland. And uh, I'm, I'm encouraging people uh, every day to get involved. And I, I can't speak uh, any more highly uh, than I do to, to, for the, the whole process and art of growing your own you know the, the the highs and the lows of it you know the the, the kind of <laughs> killing plants that that, that uh, process in its own right you learn from it and you bounce back and you feel all the better when you achieve uh, success then the next time you know um, oh, I, I so can't true. tell people not you just get it going you know and i think if any if there's any real truth to a gateway theory around uh, cannabis it's that uh, growing cannabis is going to make you want to grow Everything else you're so going to true. Like, you know, I'm going to grow a bit of thyme or again, or tomatoes, potatoes. You know, you'll have it, you'll have it all going before you know it. <laughs> you are clearly a cultivator, man, because that's exactly right. That is a phenomenon I've observed as well, a hundred percent. That's wild, though. Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm just so interested in the culture that I'm circling back around to a non-cultivation question. But you mentioned the hash being a primary kind of uh, Irish consumption culture. You mentioned it being tainted. Was a lot of that um, imported? I, I know there's a lot of hash elsewhere in Europe, or was that hash being made in Ireland or a combination? Oh, yeah, it was all imported for ah. sure. It was, uh, yeah, definitely coming in the soap bar would have been the, uh, with the form of hash there as well, which was um, quite uh, an infamous uh, type of hash now. <laughs> Say <laughs> that again, the soap bar? <clears throat> soap bar, yeah, it was, uh, it's quite infamous because uh, when you be, you have to burn into it, so you have to, use a flame to soften it to burn pieces off it um, but when you be doing it then there'll be like all sorts of like plastic and everything inside of it so you're like burning into your hash and next to you you like come across a little layer of plastic inside and it you're like ah for fix it and oh, you get mickey drips and everything off it. <laughs> and where's this coming from like the czech republic or like where is this coming from yeah, it was coming in from, uh, I suppose, Central Europe. Uh, the, the UK was probably a source of uh, a lot of it as well. Uh, we, we had a big problem here in Ireland, as you probably know, the, the troubles uh, with paramilitaries and stuff like that. So um, a lot of the importation of uh, hash and stuff was done to fund these paramilitaries, the, the IRA, the UVF, and uh, they, they would have, um, yeah, 
they, they wouldn't have really cared for the quality of the product, really. It was all about the money at the end of the day for them. Um, so you found uh, the quality of the hash could be really hit or miss. Yikes, man. That is bizarre. But that's what happens when you have that uh, heavy legislation. You're just encouraging that black market, which makes the products dirtier and dirtier. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Big time. But, but I suppose I, I would have worked in a, a grow shop here as well for uh, about just shy of two years. Um, Deep Root Gardening, uh, it's still open and uh, running at the moment. Um, but I was blown away when I worked inside of there because I was thinking when I went in there, I was like, oh, this is a cannabis grow shop. It only sells cannabis growing equipment. Couldn't be that busy. And it was very bloody busy. Like, you know, you wouldn't have the, the shop full, but, you know, as one person would go out, give it like five minutes, maybe the other guy was probably waiting for that guy to go away before he would come in and somebody else would walk in. <laughs> he was driving around the block. Time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the people who were growing then as well, it was so diverse. Like, it, would, it was not who you would expect to be growing cannabis at all. You would have... Um, like uh, elderly people coming in and uh, they, they would be growing drawn by the cannabis. You would have people coming in and you, you could tell that they're doing well for themselves, probably working for some high-end uh, company and stuff like that. Right. Um, you know, it just it wasn't, you know, um, the, the people who were being brought to court, you know, those 16 to 18,000 people being criminalized for cannabis, um, that they weren't representative of the people coming in, that those people coming in were like different people. And you have to wonder then, you know, it's like our application of the law, it's like, who is a catch and, those 16 to 18,000 people that, that probably looked like me, there was like hoodie wearing, uh, hanging around a particular area. But yeah, the, it, it was really eye opening that the whole uh, the amount of people who were growing cannabis there. Uh, the way I described it, if our, our guards or authorities here were to raid a house once a day, every day for the, the next five years, they still wouldn't have caught all of the growers here in Ireland, in Cork, in, in just our county of Cork alone. Wow. Man, this is one of the most eye opening global cannabis episodes we've done <laughs> i can't thank you enough this is just absolutely wonderful should we, uh, why don't we do more plugs make sure we get them in maybe i'll have a couple more questions before we wrap it up here but uh, i, I want to make sure i don't forget or, or get up against the clock martin's world podcast available everywhere right spotify all the all the podcast apps that sort of thing yeah correct yeah all of those places itunes all of that fun stuff and uh the video format then is up on uh, goes live uh, on monday wednesday friday 420, I do a news episode, uh, news show, 420 News, and that's 420 uh, Irish time, Ireland time. Uh, and interviews then, they get released as well, kind of uh, in, infrequently. Try to get one out every week, but given that there's a baby on the way very soon, um, I, I've been a bit distracted. College going on, and as well, I'm doing a master's at the moment in bioanalytical chemistry, so that's <laughs> keeping me busy too. <laughs> nice, man. That's wonderful. I love, uh, I also want to say, this is, an, this is another thing about activism and just kind of the cannabis world in general. Here in the States, now that it's a little bit more open, people are putting themselves out there more often, but there are still a lot of either people in illegal states or just old heads who grew up in this kind of anonymity. And they're so used to it and so comfortable with it that that's what they do. I think it's crazy yeah. how much you put yourself out there. I mean, you kind of, do you expect to be a martyr? Because you're, you, you, you are like putting yourself out there to a degree that most people just simply would not in a country where, as you described, it is still very uh, draconian on this matter. So, I mean, like, yeah. we appreciate you willing to do that because, again, if you're a martyr and you're a peaceful martyr, it shows the injustice. It shows the, the contrast. Excuse me, I'm holding back a, a hiccup. I'm, my voice isn't cracking because yeah, I'm emotional. <laughs> I am emotional, though. I got to say, uh, it, it's very impressive. And I mean, I, it's just crazy, man. You got a family and I don't like judge people for not being out there enough. I like to keep my personal life private as much as I am out there in the cannabis community. And I just want to say, by contrast, I am stunned and impressed by how fearless you are with just putting yourself out there. Like, yes, I have a family. Yes, I have a wife. Because that is the face of the cannabis smoker. So, I mean, I commend you for that. And you're, you're acting like a martyr, man. Fearless, yeah. fearless, like a martyr. Yeah. And, and to answer the question, I suppose, uh, I, I did expect to be uh, martyrized by this. Did, did I want to be? Um, I, I certainly didn't uh, want it at all. <laughs> but now since I've kind of embarked on, on this campaign, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now, is there kind of almost being so out there, having such public support now? Um, yeah, are they, afraid they don't want to touch you. They don't, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering that, you know, is the, 
are they afraid of that Barbara Streisand effect, you know, that if they were to kind of um, go and uh, arrest me, that they're going to completely just magnify my message, like yes. way more than what I could achieve on, on my own. Uh, I, alone. Hope, I hope that whoever is on your case in Ireland, whatever the FBI's version is in Ireland, I hope that they listen <laughs> to every podcast that you do and that you're on. And I hope they listen to this because you're a hundred percent right. Because right now you're just a dude coming on some shows and the cannabis industry is like, indus- uh, is interested. But if yeah. they got you bad, that could actually be worldwide news. It would definitely be nationwide news. And for instance, shows like me, I'd pick that up and make sure that everybody in my following heard, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're right. They don't want to touch you and it would magnify your message. So, so keep up the good work, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh, you know, there, there definitely is a global movement for, for this now, um, as it's going on. Um, we have currently, is it Canada, who have Uruguay are the, the two countries that have actually legalized it on a national level, but uh, soon Mexico is going to, going to join. Uh, and that there's another source of inspiration down there is uh, Pepe Rivera. And uh, I don't know if you've uh, chatted or came across Pepe Rivera, but I'd highly recommend him as a, a, a person to get in touch with. Um, he's below there in uh, the, the Plantón Cuatro Vente, which is plant, Plantation 420. Um, and that's set up. It's like a cannabis garden next to the uh, Mexican Senate buildings. And uh, they're doing some tremendous work. And, and again, another amazing Holy source shit. of inspiration for me. I've, I've had him on the, get, the podcast as a guest before, but um, an amazing guest. Highly recommend him. And, uh, Let's do it. I, I, it yeah, I definitely. Uh, it, they're, they're, they've pro- progressed along as well. And I think like with America as well now, the, the possibility of federal legalization as well, it's, it's just inevitable now that this... Uh, the global prohibition of cannabis, it's it, it's a house of cards that's just waiting to, to crumble, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's ab- that's absolutely right. Um, well, that's perfect for global cannabis. And, and you're right. I think they passed a bill and then they, they kind of just paused it because of COVID, but it had already passed down in Mexico. Um, something like yeah, that. Yeah, well, well what's more interesting about Mexico is that they, they found that the prohibition of cannabis is actually a violation of their human rights. That That's what the, the, oh, the Supreme wow. Court Good. in Mexico approves. And we, we all have these same human rights. Though. We all have them enshrined under the United Nations, um, you know, the Convention of Human Rights. And they rule in Mexico that, hey, this violates your human rights. <laughs> wow. I fucking love that, man. That, that's, that's incredible. This has been a really powerful episode. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. What, uh, what can we look forward to coming up with you? Are you uh, doing any new appearance? I mean, I know you got the, you got the family on the way. But, yeah. Uh, any new appearances? Any cool Martin's World episodes coming up? What's coming down the pipe? Yeah, there's a very good campaign coming up here, and I'm glad you kind of asked it. It'll probably be uh, after happening by the time this gets released now. Um, but on the 5th of November, this, this Friday coming, um, it's going to be the 20th anniversary of uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, Luke Ming Flanagan. Well, well, he, he was much like me before in the past, uh, before he got elected and became a politician and uh, other issues became um, a bit more of uh, his thing. But he, he was a big, big uh, activist for cannabis um, legalization here in Ireland. And he embarked on a campaign where he sent a cannabis joint, um, cannabis he grew himself in a, in a bog on the west of Ireland. Um, he, he sent a joint to every politician in the island of Ireland and uh, to some media outlets as well. <laughs> um, so given that it's the 20th anniversary this Friday, we're, we're recreating that event. And we're going to be sending cannabis joints to uh, all of the politicians across the island of Ireland and to uh, a number of media outlets as well. And uh, also, as Ming did too, um, we're going to include in it uh, a letter um, outlining the, the, the reason for the campaign happening and 10 reasons too as to why cannabis prohibition needs to be ended um, immediately. Wow. So it should be a great, great campaign. Hopefully we capture the attention of the uh, media here. As, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a bill going to be published uh, very soon, which is speaking to legalize cannabis here for adult use in Ireland. Um, and that's going to be published by Gino Kenny, uh, a TD with the People Before Profit is the name of his party. But that's going to be published very soon. I, I haven't got my eyes on it yet. Uh, it's not been put out in the, the public uh, sphere yet. But it is getting published this month. And uh, hopefully it will be debated and voted on uh, within the, the next two to three months, hopefully. Oh my, big times, and we wish you the best there. Un- unfortunately, I'm going to be traveling, so we're recording this quite a bit ahead of time. Oh, yeah. But I love that. I love that protest, and I'll go ahead and blast that out to my Instagram audience and say, you know, I just re- recorded an episode with Martin, and here's something cool going on in Ireland. I think that's that's really great, man. 
Excellent. Yeah, there's a Facebook event up there and I think there's going to be a blog post and, uh, published there very soon as well. Uh, I'll send you the links to those yeah, too. Perfect, um, and, man. Perfect. Also, another thing happening here in Ireland, just uh, in the global news of, of things, um, there's going to be a, a citizens' assembly that happens here in Ireland. And a topic uh, for discussion on the citizens' assembly is going to be the decriminalization of the drug user. So it's going to be basically looking at the decriminalization of uh, personal use of, of all drugs decriminalization of the drug user. And again, just put in perspective, the Citizens' Assembly here in Ireland, that was monumental in recent changes, um, changes which would people would never have thought would have happened here, which would have included uh, allowing for abortions here in Ireland and allowing for gay marriage. So the Citizens' Assembly pay, played a pivotal part in those changes, and we believe it will play a pivotal part in the changing of our drug laws here in Ireland too. And oh, that's... Wow. Hopefully, going to happen in the uh, the first quarter of uh, 2022. So, fingers crossed for good news there as well from Ireland. That would be great. I mean, getting cannabis legalized so people can get their medicine, fantastic. You know, stop imprisoning people for for a condition of addiction. That would be even better, man. Godspeed, Martin. You're doing God's work out there. Yeah, th- thanks, and thanks very much for giving me this opportunity. You know, just trying to get this message out there to a wider audience. Um, I really do appreciate it. Of course. Of course, man. Anytime. We'll have you back for sure. I know that people are going to be writing, uh, raving about this episode. So good luck to you and all of your ventures. I hope you have a wonderful uh, experience there with your baby on the way. Thanks. You know, as a first time parent, you can hit me up anytime, man. I understand how it goes. And uh, I think I know it's just going to be wonderful for you. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Martin, again. And uh, we will have you back on for sure. Appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, anytime, anything uh, Ireland related, by all means, uh, fire me, uh, get, get in touch, and I'm happy to fill in. That is so cool. That's awesome. All right, listeners, you know what to do. Martin's World Podcast, go subscribe, check him out, Martin Condon, and everything he's doing all over the place. Stay tuned to Growcast. Find Growcast on Instagram at Growcast. All the fun stuff, membership, Discord, green list is free, growcastpodcast.com slash list. Get on it. That's all for today, everybody. This is Martin Condon and Jordan River signing off. Saying be safe out there, everybody, and grow smarter. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this inaugural episode of Worldwide December. We've got more coming at you from all over the states and all over the globe. Before we wrap it up, I've got a special new offer from Canna Planners to tell you about. Canna Planners creating the website that you need for your cannabis business. You can now get $420 off your brand new website. They made our website. They've made websites for breeders. You've heard on this show. You can go to canaplanners.com slash growcast and get $420 off your already affordable and powerful website. Go get a quote now at canaplanners.com slash growcast. That's C-A-N-N-A-P-L-A-N-N-E-R-S.com slash growcast. And then you'll get $420 off. Everybody, it's 420, baby can't get any better than that. Canna Planners is creating beautiful, powerful websites, and they know what you need to succeed in the cannabis space. They also do marketing, list building, all sorts of stuff you can find at cannaplanners.com. I'm sure they'll help you with your non-cannabis business too, but you heard it here. Get that quote at cannaplanners.com slash growcast. $420 off your primo website. All right. What else do we have? Join the order, of course. So much change going on there. Thank you to all the members. I appreciate you so much. Thank you to you listeners. I hope you're doing incredible things in your garden. As you hear this, I am back in the States. Nikan is over. We are just kicking it. Lots more to come this month and also new themed months coming throughout 2022. All right, everybody. Love you all. See you next time.